Hello, I'm Adam Ferry, Occupational Therapist and Director of the OT Service. And I'm Lucy Leonard and I'm an Occupational Therapist and Director with the OT Service. Today we're going to be talking about future-proofing for our clients. So when we're thinking about future-proofing, I think we have to think about the initial assessment and the kind of things that we're looking at on the initial assessment. So I think the sort of things that I would be looking at are gathering information about the client's medical condition, um, asking them that, about their signs and symptoms, and maybe also speaking with other members of the multidisciplinary team to get some information on their, their past medical history. Yeah. So how do you feel about the idea of future proofing and um, that potential conflict um, between what we would normally teach about that being an objective assessment based on the application of an activity analysis if we are seeming to predict what might happen in the future. That's something that I've maybe conflicted myself with in the past. How would you start to, to deal with that or rationalise that as part of your clinical reasoning? I think when we're working with people it's important to be realistic about the trajectory of their condition and how it might deteriorate over time. So for me, it would be on the initial assessment, gathering information about how they're managing. Mm. So looking at their, their function um, and speaking with them about how things may change over time and actually future planning and future proofing would mean that we don't have to go back as many times mm. and assess them in the future. It's about that understanding of the diagnostic clinical reasoning and it's not just about those typical um, degenerative neurological conditions, I suppose it's about ageing as well. Um, we need to accept that as we age and through our lifespan or how we engage in, in meaningful activity changes, as our bodies change, as our lifestyles change. From my perspective, clinically, a lot of the future proofing I've done has been about supporting ageing as well as supporting um, those people with long-term um, degenerative conditions like some of the more typical neurological ones we might associate that with? I think the difference with a complex neurological condition might be that the deterioration might be rapid mm. and therefore we might have to think quite quickly about what would happen if this person deteriorated quickly. Um, so we need to think about modular things possibly, what can we add on to a piece of equipment, so for example a closet mat toilet, you could put on um, some lateral supports, you could put on the, the um, arms on the side which would help somebody with their transfers and they are things that can be added retrospectively or possibly um, immediately if, those, if they're going to meet somebody's needs. Yeah, I think that's a really good point because um, often we talk about people not wanting to see or look at things that they may need in the future. I know certainly from a statutory services perspective, if we're thinking about future-proofing, some of the things that they might get or they might receive might not be things that you might want to just store mm -hmm. or look at and think, you know, so say for example, a hoist. You might not want to look at that hoist, even if you might need it in a month's time, who knows? The idea of seeing something that you are going to end up needing might actually, from a mental health perspective or psychologically, be quite damaging. Um, so, but I think having things that are modular or that can change very quickly, or now the things that are just more aesthetically pleasing, mm -hmm. um, makes a big difference to that to that person's well-being, regardless of how rapid or slow that progression is. I think that's the skill of an occupational therapist, isn't it, is to speak to somebody about their condition, how it may change and how we can find solutions to meet that person's needs and sometimes it's just about that discussion, not necessarily providing that piece of equipment but just talking about it and almost planting a seed and saying this is something that you might need in the future mm. and that's certainly a skill of an occupational therapist to understand function and occupation and help somebody to understand their condition and how we can meet their needs. Sure. So if we were thinking about that in the context of an initial assessment, would I be right? Would your experience be the same in that I wouldn't necessarily be saying, or always anyway, wouldn't necessarily be saying, you're going to need X, Y, and Z. Mm. 
But as part of that initial assessment, my scope while I'm there might just be slightly more extended or I might feel like it's a bit more extended. So I'll make recommendations to meet immediate need, but I might also be checking the environment for future considerations. So for example, you know, if, if I thought somebody was going to need some kind of seal and track um, system in, in, the, in the future, whenever that future may be, I'd be making, putting extra emphasis on what are the ceilings like, would the space accommodate transfers in this sort of environment. So as we got closer to that time of need, we then can just go and run with it rather than needing to start that process again. Is that the sort of thing you would Yeah, advise? I think with major adaptations, it's really important to work closely with technical officers and architects to, like you say, plan the environment for the future. So things like if you think somebody might need a wash dry toilet in the future and it's not something they're wanting to accept now or it's not appropriate to prescribe that, putting something like a fuse spare, mm -hmm. which I've done in the bathroom, near to the toilet means that it'd be very easy to put in a closet mat toilet in the future. Um, and like you say, the ceilings and things like that. So it's really important to understand what our skills are as an occupational therapist and work closely with the technical officers and architects who are skilled in the, the understanding of the building and what, what the art of the possibility. Yeah, it's a really good point. And even basic things like if in a bathroom environment um, is being built but somebody is choosing not to have something else at that time and you're going with, um, uh, let's use the example of a underfloor heating, mm -hmm having a plan of where that underfloor heating is for the future yeah. so that future builds or future adaptations are aware of of where that's mapped on the floor yeah. little things like that can make a big difference in the future can't they yeah definitely and also the position of a shower so if somebody's able to walk into a shower to stand while showering but their condition may deteriorate in the future where they need to sit down it's thinking about the position of the shower can they reach the controls in standing and in seating as well? So that's mm. another example of future-proofing mm. the environment as well. I think it's all well and good us talking about future-proofing. Um, and obviously there are drivers there for this managing long-term um, health and well-being, uh, now more, more so than ever with something like the CARE Act. Um, but obviously um, adaptation funding doesn't come from the CARE Act specifically so as much as things are there in terms of legislation and um, as part of our code of ethics it talks about the person being um, uh, the expert in themselves mm -hmm. and how we should proactively manage long-term health and well-being ultimately funding doesn't come from from our code of ethics or or from the care act um, so in your experience how accessible is future proofing from a costing perspective? I think that's where your professional reason, reasoning and clinical reasoning comes into it. It's about us communicating to the fund holders the needs of the client and actually acting as an advocate for the client mm. and explaining that if we outlay a certain cost now, then it's going to save money in the future. So I always say to people, we don't want to keep coming back and keep having to spend money. It'd be great if we can just do everything we need to do now to meet your needs. Mm. So we can use the Disabled Facilities Grant funding if your statutory services, and often I will certainly act as an advocate for my clients um, and patients when communicating what they need for the future. Actually, we're being asked much more about well, what is that? What are that person's long-term toileting needs? Are they going to be able to clean themselves over this period of time? You know, if we're thinking about somebody with de degenerative condition what um, what is modular what if that person can't transfer anymore how is is does that render the adaptation meaningless mm -hmm. um, there's certainly questions that we're being asked to justify in in the majority of our recommendations i would say yeah i think it's really important to think about toilet transfers because at some point somebody may not be able to transfer directly on the toilet so for example if they're condition deteriorated where they needed hoisting, we need to think about how they would get on and off a toilet. And that's where we might introduce something like a commode shower chair. Mm. Um, and we might push them into the bathroom to and push them over a toilet and into the shower. And that would 
reduce the number of transfers that they need to undertake. Yeah, and that in itself raises a, a really interesting point, doesn't it? The, the, the shower chair discussion, because we're repeatedly asked um, as, cl as clinicians, but also when we're providing Clozomat with, um, with clinical support about that issue of compatibility. Mm. And I don't know what you think about this, but compatibility seems to have become a question about what goes over the toilet. Absolutely. Whereas actually it's a, it's a bigger issue than that, isn't it? Yes. Because if we're thinking about the long-term management of somebody's needs, the term compatibility, if it's just about it going over the toilet, if that affects the outcome or it reduces the effectiveness of the product that was there in the first place, um, could be counterintuitive. Yes, absolutely. So we need to start asking a bit more about that. So yes, it's obviously incredibly important what, what goes over it in terms of long-term future-proofing, but we need to be asking questions about um, the uh, douche length mm. and positioning, mm. um, how the water flows from that, what the water pressure is, mm -hmm. you know, how, how does something going over the toilet affect the outcome and making sure that compatibility actually means something that it supports the functional outcome. Absolutely. Do you have that shared experience? Yes, it's a question that I'm asked a lot about compatibility. Does this shower chair go over the toilet? And like you say, there's so much more to than just being able to place a shower chair or commode chair over a toilet. We need to think about that person, are they getting clean? Like you say, that the water pressure, is it high enough? Because when you're sitting on a shower chair, you could be four or five inches above where you would be normally. Mm. So we have to ask questions. As occupational therapists, we have to be really critical thinkers and not just accept that this is compatible because it fits over, but actually look at the product and say, is it cleaning this person effectively? Are they still maintaining their independence? when they're using the, the wash-dry toilet. Yeah. So that's a really important point about compatibility. And I could say it's about evaluating a piece of equipment and evaluating a product and using those critical thinking skills that I think we all have to say, is this going to work for the person? Are we going to get the most effective outcomes? Yeah, no, that's really important. So we've covered quite a lot of topics around future-proofing, but I know occupational therapists are really practical people, so I wonder if it would be helpful just to talk about an example of future-proofing. I received um, a good while ago a, a referral to go and help somebody um, provide them with advice about their bed transfer. Okay. This was a person who had had an elective lower limb amputation because of uh, rheumatoid pain. Um, was a new wheelchair user, had a husband of a similar age to them, both in their mid-80s, and he was helping her with the, with the bed transfer. Um, so on the face of it, the referral was very much about how do you help somebody get from there, from there to there? Very straightforward. Mm. But actually it became much more about future-proofing. Um, Again, at the beginning of this, we talked about that kind of diagnostic clinical reason and our understanding of conditions and how we support somebody's long-term health and well-being. And in this case, the husband was doing a lot as an informal carer as well. So my duty to him and his long-term health and well-being. So when, when I was there, actually the transfer itself was very easy to resolve with some basic equipment and it enabled her to transfer on off the bed independently and didn't need his support at all. However, based on my knowledge of the condition and the other support that he was providing, alongside that kind of professional ethos of maximizing independence and uh, supporting engagement in meaningful activity, as, as we were there, are there to do, what I needed to do was then provide them support or recommendations rather than support in the longer term. So he was doing an awful lot. And as even as much as her transfer was very then independent, it became very obvious that uh, that wasn't going to be able to be the case forever. Mm -hmm. You know, she had a lot of shoulder pain as well because of rheumatoid condition. And yes, this particular challenge was caused because of a lower limb amputation, but there was absolutely no doubt that future challenges were going to arise 
either because of extra effort she was using with her shoulders to compensate for not being able to weight bear through one side, but also then the pain she was going to be creating on the other side of her of our body and the extra support therefore that her husband was going to need to provide. So an example of that would be um, she was a new, new to self-propelling in a wheelchair. So as we all know, a lot of effort for that through the shoulders. Yeah, and challenging when you're in your 80s as well. Absolutely, yeah. In a house with relatively limited turning circle, mm -hmm. two-storey property, um, doorways that supported her getting in, but we know what these wheelchairs are like. You know, it was taking some paintwork probably off the, off the door frames. Husband who was needing to place um, a commode next to our bed at night, at this point they were in separate rooms, move the wheelchair out of the way, get the commode in place and then do the opposite in the morning to enable her to then transfer into the wheelchair. He was making all of the meals, she, um, she had certain activities in the day, leisure activities that she was unable to participate in anymore because of basic things like bench heights, mm -hmm. um, accessibility to space with a wheelchair, so a recess under, under things, under tables, workspaces. So there was some really basic work to do there and recommendations to make about how to maximise her engagement in, in meaningful activity and maximise independence so that she was slightly less reliant on him, which supported his long-term health and well-being. But alongside that, trying to help them gain some kind of understanding and what her long-term needs might be. And if they continued to do things in the same way that they were doing them, the strain that that would then put on them and how, in this case, unmanageable that, that would actually be. It's quite interesting, isn't it, how the referrals for a bed transfer mm. and you've gone and you've done a truly holistic assessment because you've looked at the um, other activities of daily living, including leisure and social activities, which is something that often gets missed. So. It is. How often is that the case? Mm. You know, we get a referral for something that seems relatively straightforward. It's for one bit of work, but we can't go in blinkered. Mm. Um, all of our assessments need to be client-centred and holistic and in this case look at what somebody's long-term needs are. Mm. They in their mind had accepted that they would need a stair lift in the future. Okay. But as we know that transfer on and off the stair lift um, in lots of circumstances is absolutely fine and absolutely safe but actually in, with her condition and her level of pain I was concerned that they could go down the route of that stair lift but in a couple of years' time, it wouldn't be suitable anymore because she, wouldn't be, she would no longer be able to do that transfer safely. Um, something that allowed her to tilt the wheelchair um, electronically um, because of some pressure areas, some pressure issues she had on the top of her thighs and, and her buttocks. So she was able to redistribute that pressure and allow her to get around both indoors and outdoors without needing to put that strain through her shoulders. It also then was compatible, we've used that word compatibility, it was compatible with the through floor lift. So it's thinking about all putting all these, these things together as a package. She wanted to be able to do more in the kitchen and rely less on her husband. Not because he didn't want to do it, but it wasn't part of what would have been their normal routine or their normal roles as husband and wife. Um, so we talked about uh, longer term adaptations in the kitchen with height adjustable workspaces so they could both uh, do activities together at the same time or, or separately uh, and apart. Um, things where she had accessible height uh, facilities in there, so what hobs was she, was she using? That, old, that issue that everybody has with a standard kitchen of how do you open a cupboard door when the wheelchair's up against the cupboard? How do you access the sink when there's no recess? Mm -hmm. All those sorts of things. So the main things we'd looked at were wheelchair, through floor lift, kitchen adaptations, and then the bathroom. Okay. So their main bathroom was upstairs, um, and it already had a very accessible shower space. Actually, there was very little to do in there, but her bedroom was on the ground floor, and she was happy for that. But they had a downstairs toilet. Okay. So one of the things we had to look at there was to enable her to, one, use the toilet whenever she wanted to, rather than having to use the commode through the night, because that then changed how that dynamic worked. You know, I talked about her husband having to move bits of furniture around. Yeah. 
how she would transfer to it, and then again, in the longer term, how long was she going to be able to clean herself after using the toilet? She had very limited range of movement. Um, how long was she going to be able to use a standard push flush for? So all those things in. So in this instance, I, re I recommended the, the Palmer Vita with, um, with the pressure pad sensor as part of that longer term solution. Okay, brilliant. I, I like the way that you can talk about life roles as well because I suppose for a husband and wife that may have been together for a number of years, it's not normal for a husband to be emptying a commode or assisting his wife to the toilet. So occupational therapists really should be looking at life roles and helping people to maintain those life roles because it's really, really important, isn't it? That Absolutely. they can not only engage in the activities and occupations that are important to them, but to maintain those life roles. Absolutely. Remembering that what's normal for us isn't necessarily normal to the next person. How accepting were they of your recommendations? So um, there were some recommendations they took and some recommendations that they didn't. Um, but I didn't feel like my job was to tell them what they needed. My job was to advocate for them as their occupational therapist and provide them with information that allowed them to make capacitated and informed decisions. So that sounds like you used a partnership approach to meeting their goals and their needs, so working with the client and the husband and yourself and, and finding the solutions together. And we also have to accept that people can make those decisions and not take on board all of our recommendations and that's absolutely fine. But like you say, it's about empowering them and giving them the, the knowledge to, to be able to make those decisions for themselves. Absolutely. So I think we've covered quite a lot on future proofing in this short discussion. We've talked about the initial assessment and how we sort of plan for future proofing when we first meet somebody. We've talked about planning the environment for the future, modular things, equipment and um, compatibility of products. And I think you've given a really good example of um, a real life situation where you've had to consider future proofing. That's been really useful. Mm -hmm.